Hello and welcome to this evening's UCSF Alumni Author Series, a conversation with Diana Hendel, UCSF School of Pharmacy, Class of 1989. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Katie Maloney and I serve as Senior Director of Alumni Relations. Before we start today's program, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items to help your experience. We are recording tonight's program and we'll share it with you via email in a few days. To submit a question at any time, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please be sure to keep your questions brief. Given the size of the audience and the number of our questions, our speakers may not be able to answer everything, but we hope to offer an interesting conversation and answer many questions about Dr. Hendel's memoir, Responsible, and her latest book, Why Cope When You Can Heal, How Healthcare Heroes of COVID-19 Can Recover from PTSD. We are honored to have UCSF Health President and CEO, Mark Larratt, join us to have this conversation with Dr. Hendel. Let me introduce them both now. Mark Larratt is President and Chief Executive Officer of UCSF Health, which is comprised of Benioff Children's Hospital, San Francisco, and Oakland Langley Park Psychiatric Hospital and Clinics, and the faculty practice. Mr. Larratt joined UCSF in 2000 and is a, a 30-year veteran of healthcare management and a national e leader in healthcare reform. As CEO of UCSF Medical Center and UCSF um, Benioff Children's Hospitals, Mark heads one of the most distinguished medical institutions in the world, one that is consistently ranked by US News and World Report as one of the top hospitals in the United States and as the best in Northern California. At UCSF, he has led initiatives to improve quality of care and patient safety and to moder modernize facilities and equipment. He led an effort to build a $1.5 billion UCSF hospital complex at the Mission Bay campus, including hospitals for children, women's centers, and cancer. Mr. Larratt earned a bachelor's degree at UCLA and a master's degree at the University of Southern California, both in political science. Mr. Larratt will be speaking with and posing your questions to our UCSF alumni author, Dr. Diana Hendel. She is an executive coach and leadership consultant, former hospital CEO and author of Responsible, a memoir, a riveting and insightful account of leading during and through the aftermath of a deadly workplace trauma. She is also the co-author of the recently released book, Why Cope When You Can Heal, How Healthcare Heroes of COVID-19 Can Recover from PTSD, and the soon to be published Trauma to Triumph a roadmap for leading through disruption and thriving on the other side. As the CEO of Long Beach Memorial Medical Center and Miller Children's and Women's Hospital, Dr. Hendel led one of the largest acute care, trauma and teaching hospital complexes on the West Coast. She earned a BS in Biological Sciences from UC Irvine and a Doctor of Pharmacy degree from UCSF. Welcome home to UCSF, Dr. Hendel, and thank you, Mr. Larratt, for joining us for tonight's program. I look forward to your conversation. Well, thank you, Katie, and uh, welcome, Diana. It's uh, great to have you here. Well, thank you, Mark. It's wonderful. It's such a great honor to be here and really appreciative of the many former colleagues and alumni and family and friends and fellow healthcare professionals who've joined this evening. You know, Diana, since we're talking to a UCSF audience uh, and you, in a way, got your professional start here, uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what inspired you to become a pharmacist and how did UCSF help uh, equip you for your professional career? You know, about midway through my undergraduate experience at UC Irvine, I began the quest of, well, what do I do next? Um, I was a couple of years away from getting a degree in biological sciences, and I considered teaching, uh, considered research, and those were very interesting. Um, but I also began to look at the healthcare professions. And in my research, I found that pharmacy just spoke to me, uh, in particular clinical pharmacy. Um, I could teach, I could do research if I um, wanted to. Um, it had so much variety and so many different settings where I could practice. Um, and of course, UC San Francisco was the place to go for clinical pharmacy training and education, uh, Ms. Mecca. Um, so I embarked on 
um, applying and was so fortunate and really grateful to be admitted uh, to what became the class of 1989. So Diana, you uh, uh, graduated in 1989 and then uh, you began your healthcare career and uh, it took you in a uh, lot of different directions, ultimately becoming a CEO of a very large hospital, Long Beach Memorial uh, in Long Beach. Tell us a little bit about that journey. Well, I was fortunate uh, during my fourth year rotations to be assigned to Long Beach Memorial for a number of them. And so I got exposed to Long Beach Memorial and Miller Children's Hospital. Long Beach Memorial has a very strong connection with UC San Francisco and for now decades has done a lot of training for clinical pharmacists. Um, so I decided that I wanted to do a clinical residency, clinical pharmacy residency at Long Beach Memorial and was thrilled. Uh, I ended up getting selected to be a PG um, you know, first year clinical pharmacy resident. Um, but about midway through that year, and I had, um, I'd envisioned becoming a critical care pharmacist. That was my dream at the time. But about midway through, a number of my mentors began to talk to me about perhaps pursuing a second year residency and doing the hospital administration or the pharmacy administration residency. And at the time, I remember thinking, well, I just wanted to get a job. I'd been to school for so many years and then residency. But something spoke to me about the inner workings of a hospital, getting to see all the other disciplines and how they work together, how no one person could care for a patient herself, that it required a team. And so I was really intrigued by all the handoffs, all the operations. And so I said yes to the hospital um, administration residency. And for then for the next 10 years, I stayed very close to pharmacy. I was a supervisor in the pharmacy department and then a director and then an executive director. And then I made my way around our memorial care health system um, as a vice president of operations at one of the campuses, as a chief administrative officer for one of the other newly admitted hospitals to our healthcare system. And then came full circle and became COO at Long Beach Memorial before being appointed uh, the CEO of both Long Beach Memorial and Miller Children's Hospital in early 2009. That's a, that's a remarkable story and a, a testament to not only your clinical skills, but your administrative skills as well. Uh, Diana, uh, probably most of the people on this call are in healthcare, but maybe you could share some of your thoughts about what are some of the best parts of being in healthcare and the most motivating parts of it. And then maybe spend a few minutes talking about the, the parts of it that people may not know so well, the, the hard part of it, the, the disappointing parts of, uh, of being in healthcare. Well, sure. So I'll describe uh, what it's like at Long Beach Memorial Miller Children's. And this is like virtually every, every other hospital and healthcare setting. Um, in healthcare, there is this tremendous esprit de corps. There's that sense of teamwork. There's that sense of higher purpose and calling, that sense of being dedicated to serve other people. Um, healthcare arenas by their very nature uh, attract uh, groups that become very tightly knit, um, again, focused on caring for other people. For Long Beach Memorial Miller Children's, it was a cornerstone of the community. So not only providing uh, a large amount of service, healthcare service to people in the community, we were an economic engine. We were amongst the largest employers. So we had that responsibility of serving as an employer. But then we were also educators, educators of the community, of course, but also educators of countless medical professionals and other healthcare um, ancillary professions. And so that sense of, um, it was a city within a city. Um, of course, it never closed. You know, hospitals are open 24 seven. Um, they are cities within cities. And so there's a magic to them. Um, when you put a group of people that belong together and have common purpose and sense of calling, it is an extraordinary experience. Wow. Now, the things that are difficult are that um, certainly healthcare people deal with life and death. And um, on some days, it might be the very best person's uh, experience, a patient. Uh, might be here to, to give birth, to deliver a baby, the very best experience for that person or that family member. Um, but it, similarly, 
at the very same time where someone is delivering a baby, perhaps another family member or person is passing away and it's the most difficult or challenging or devastating day. So holding both of those, the range, that uh, amazing experience of holding both extremes is something that is both challenging, but of course, welcomed by healthcare workers and, and professionals. Feels like uh, you're describing an incredible intimacy that yes. you develop with uh, a relationship with your patients. Yeah, that's a perfect uh, word. Intimacy and it's sacred, um, sacred. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a wonderful way to describe it. And as we spend a lot of time talking about service to the underserved and, and helping uh, deal with longstanding issues like health inequities, it does feel like it's, it's more than a job. It's, it's something so meaningful. Uh, so Diana, uh, you were, you'd become CEO of Long Beach Memorial and, uh, and then uh, this day, uh, April 16th, 2009 came about. Can you tell us about that day and how that day came to change your, your life? Yeah. So Mark, that was the day that everything changed. Um, April 16th, 2009. I think of it as the day that marked the before and the day that marked the after. Um, it started like so many other days for me with a lot of rounding, um, doing administrative rounds. So greeting employees and, and physicians, um, certainly helping patients and visitors with wayfinding, just sort of that sense of being, taking the pulse and being within the organization. It was really my favorite part of, of leadership. Um, it happened to be an unusually light meeting day for me. So I circulated much longer than I might've normally had time to do. Um, it also happened to be my hundredth day as CEO. And it was a day that in that moment, I sort of took stock and celebrated because I felt like, um, well, I've got this, I, I, I can do this job. Um, I'm gonna learn an awful lot, I'm gonna be challenged, but I could, it was the right job for me. I knew it was my calling. It was the role that I was meant to be in. And so with that sense of celebration, um, I wandered the halls. It also on that day, we had gone through like every other organization, um, tremendous amount of financial stress and strain. You know, it was early 2009. Of course, the crash of 2008 had put everybody into financial dire straits. Um, we had made an announcement about uh, a layoff, um, but we'd begun to turn the corner financially. So I privately knew that our financials were turning around and I was really hopeful that those layoffs would be very minimal. So I felt kind of buoyant. Um, but a little before noon that day, uh, a man came to the outpatient pharmacy, which was located in the lobby of the hospital, and he shot and killed the supervisor of the pharmacy. Um, he then traveled through the halls of the hospital and he exited the building where he then shot another man, um, the executive director of the pharmacy department. And then eventually the shooter turned the gun on himself and killed himself. Uh, my office was adjacent to the lobby, so I was in the vicinity, um, and as the CEO, I ended up responding to all three scenes. Um, both the shooter and the supervisor of the outpatient pharmacy, the supervisor of the outpatient pharmacy, his name was Hugo Bustamante, uh, ended up dying on the scene. Um, and while we went on lockdown um, and the ED went on diversion, um, we couldn't close the hospital, of course. We still had more than 600 patients in-house that we were caring for, and now we were caring for one of our own. Um, we, the executive director of the pharmacy department who had been shot was still alive, um, and we were um, hopeful that he could be saved. Um, he was our colleague. Um, he was fighting for his life. Um, he also happened to be a good friend someone I'd worked with for more than 20 years. And I know that he's was a good friend um, and a classmate to many of you here tonight um, and a fellow UC San Francisco um, graduate of the School of Pharmacy and his name was Kelly Hales. So the event of course was horrific um, in and of itself, but what shocked us even more to the core was that the shooter was an insider. 
Um, he was an employee. He was a pharmacy technician who'd been well known um, and highly regarded. In fact, he'd been uh, honored as the employee of the month just recently. Um, he'd been one of our own too. Of course, rumors about what motivated, motivated him surfaced immediately. Um, and while there was a lot of speculation about why he'd done what he'd done, uh, one rumor in particular, a uh, rumor about his motive, about anger around the upcoming layoffs, um, stuck with me and haunted me. Now, there were lots of rumors and others haunted other people. But for me, the rumor about layoff as motive, um, of course, was pr particularly dramatic. Uh, in the end, the investigation was inconclusive. Uh, we never did know. We never had resolution about why the shooter had done what he'd done. Um, the event, of course, traumatized us um, as individuals, but also as an organization itself. So that is the story of what happened on April 16th. But of course, that story continued in an aftermath for many, many more years. Diana, let's just talk about that that day a little bit more. You. Uh... You know, many of us uh, uh, try to imagine how we would react in a circumstance like that. Um, and, uh, you know, what, what skills do we lean on and how do, we, how do we show leadership? Because the organization is looking to you to set the tone. You know, could you talk a little bit about the, the, the rational Diana thinking through the CEO Diana versus the human, the emotional Diana, who's dealing with this tragedy of people that you knew and loved. And just how, how, did, you, how did you cope at that moment uh, trying to sort through all of that? Well, of course, um, initially, and what I discovered probably for many months, um, I was in deep shock. A uh, tremendous amount of shock, uh, reeling from what I had witnessed, um, reeling from the rumors about the motive, and reeling from it being a situation that we had actually never drilled for. Because at the time in 2009, active shooters, that scenario hadn't yet been drilled for. And in fact, much of the work that's been done since around preparing organizations for active shooters was done by us um, and to help other organizations should they encounter that. So that term even um, was unknown. So I was reeling and in shock, um, but I was part of a team and I was in an organization and in surrounded by a group of people who responded in a way that as much as it was the worst day of my life, it's one of the most profound experiences of my life, the camaraderie, the bonding that occurred, the we can do anything and we can get through this. Um, we also, and I came to appreciate how valuable having rapid response teams. We ca called ours like most hospitals do, code internal triage. Um, and that was our code. Having that um, structure, having that familiar structure that we had both practiced and of course, ha of course had real scenarios, not an active shooter, but other scenarios. Um, so ha having that structure grounded us, it helped to steady our emotions, helped to give us some framework. Um, but ultimately it was knowing that we needed to stay together, knowing we needed to not divide um, and create division, especially with circulating motives. Um, it was the driving force, that sense of unity that we needed to instill. That was the driving force. Um, I didn't want the event to shatter us and ruin us. Um, I also wanted to honor Hugo and Kelly by being able to go on. I knew they would want us to be able to stay together, that this wouldn't destroy the organization or destroy, destroy any of us as people. So that's what that was what was motivating that day. In your book, which I would encourage absolutely everybody to read, uh, Responsible, a memoir, uh, which I, I told Diana, I thought was just 
gripping in its uh, in its honesty and and uh, and and rawness in a way. Uh, but one of the things you mentioned in the book is that immediately after when you first saw the first person having been shot, one of the staff members said, "You know, this is your fault," or words to that effect. And then this then this whole guilt that. I guess you must have experienced over this whole issue of the layoffs, the threat of layoffs and doing all that. That seems like an enormous burden to put on, on any human being. Uh, how did you deal with that? Well, at the first scene when I encountered, and I didn't yet know what actually had transpired. Um, I, I didn't even know who'd been shot, uh, much less who had done the shooting. Um, the, in, in helping the uh, pharmacy employees, um, what, I, what was said was, you sh should have known that this could happen. Um, and it, was, it came out of a sense of needing help and needing um, me to make it better. It, it, I heard it as blame. I heard it as fault. Um, reflecting years later, of course, um, and and even not too much longer afterwards. Reflecting, I knew logically that isn't what was intended. I knew logically that I wasn't at fault or to blame. But trauma has a way of in, of instilling guilt and self blame, um, and it's it's difficult to describe because I would have said prior to that event that I would have had a very strong boundary about not taking more responsibility than, than I should, but trauma and that shock. Um, so what was said, I know now what the spirit of what was said, but I also know how I heard it um, and the story I told myself. And I wasn't alone in creating a narrative each of us, we all had a very different experience. We all had different points of view. We all had different relationships with the shooter. Um, we had different relationships with each of the two victims. And so for each of us, depending upon our relationship and our proximity, we each would have a story that would emerge that perhaps many, and as of course over the years have talked to many others of how they felt a sense of, of guilt. Um, their sense of maybe someone should have spoken up or perhaps we could have prevented this. So there's so many different ways that we begin to second guess. And it is really common for individuals and within organization when trauma happens, um, this sense of guilt and self-blame. It took a lot of years for me to process and to put the responsibility where it really belongs with the shooter himself. Um, but I carried that sense of responsibility uh, for a lot of years. I'd like to come back in a minute to your journey after the, that, that fateful day, but maybe talk a little bit about how the organization was traumatized by this and how did it uh, respond and rebound, uh, if you will, from uh, that because as you pointed out at the beginning, these are 24 seven operations and there's 600 people upstairs who have their own life journey and family and friends and so forth. So talk a little bit about that if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, there's so much that's been you know written about how trauma affects individuals, but very little about how it affects the culture of the organization. Um, I mentioned that sense of camaraderie and altruism and bonding that without a doubt was very present. But with that sense of speculation about motive and because the shooter was an insider and because he was well regarded um, and the two victims were well loved, it created the, the instantly the question of why would he do that? And when the question why arises, of course we jump to lots of conclusions and we all have what we think we know might be the reason um, so there were lots and lots of um, motives that surfaced and each motive in some way had some bit of finger pointing, some bit of blame. And I saw that this is really common in organizations that have been traumatized. 
uh, even to the sense of um, who, what, what was not done that could have prevented it. Um, were our security checks or our background checks adequate? Um, should we have had bulletproof glass in that outpatient pharmacy? Those questions that arise, they're actually really good questions. When organizations and the people within them have been traumatized, um, they do create a sense of blame and then guilt. Um, and it becomes very, very difficult to talk about. I, th I think when we think about guilt for, let's say, um, financial performance or a project going um, awry, that has a very different kind of weight to it. Um, and I would say that until someone has experienced the feeling of being responsible for someone else, else's death, it's, it, it's so difficult to explain how, what that feels like. And I would not have known, I, I would have, wouldn't have known what that felt like, but that sense of, uh, of guilt and blame is very difficult to carry. Um, in fact, it's not really, it, um, you really can't carry it for long and truly thrive. Um, and so that has to be processed. But within organizations, that sense of why, and so the, the blame and self-blame, the guilt. And then often there's a sense of shame that can pervade the organization. Um, in our case, what about the culture allowed that to happen? Um, would patients trust us still, um, our judgment? Um, were we a sacred safe place? Um, so that sense of shame also arose. Um, and because the event was so complicated and the circumstances surrounding it, and that um, it, it became somewhat unspeakable, it became taboo, it was very difficult to, for us to have conversation. I knew as the leader that ideally, if I could facilitate those conversations, that would be a natural leadership role. I didn't yet, I couldn't come to appreciate that as the leader also traumatized, I wasn't capable of leading those kinds of conversations to the depth that was required to heal the organization's culture. Now, that being said, this was an organization comprised of more than 6,000 amazing people who had an awful lot of experience. And we were doing wonderful caregiving and lots of other wonderful work in parallel. So the organization did rebound. Um, we thrived, in fact. Um, we, we doubled down on the sense of bonding and meaning. Um, we changed how we team built. Um, we changed how we viewed our values. Um, and we overhauled our decision-making structures. And all rooted in, not, not immediately, but all rooted in that experience of the trauma. So the organization, um, we were able to rebound. We were able to then thrive. And I was really proud of the team that came together and the work that Long Beach Memorial Miller Children still do to this day. You, you mentioned that uh, at some point, not immediately after, but relatively soon after the event, somebody said, you know, we've got to move on, uh, let's, let's we've got to put this in its place and and pick up the piece and I, I wonder if you have any insights on <clears throat> how long it takes an organization to process a, a cataclysmic event like that and to put itself back on on footing where people go yes that happened it was terrible but here's where we are today uh what are your thoughts about the how long that takes? You know, I think it certainly depends on the event. Um, it certainly depends on how many people directly affected. Um, so certainly that that has an impact. Um, but I think when an organization can name it, when an organization can talk about it and it becomes not taboo, when um, when an organization can talk about the, the very natural tendencies that, that occur following trauma, that sense of blame, that it would be, 
that expected that guilt and shame may emerge. When organizations can talk openly about that, um, they can begin to heal, they can begin to process. When we can describe that the impact of the trauma may have a wide range for everyone in the organization, um, that we all experienced at different, um, and so there are different points of view. And when we can see that there are points of view that are completely in opposition, and yet they're that person's experience. Um, and so when we can see the full impact is when um, healing and, and processing can occur. Um, so it's a lot of the work that I do now in working with organizations to name it, to talk freely about it in a very facilitated, structured, careful way. Um, I would venture to say that if an organization isn't able to address it, then ultimately they don't really ever heal. Uh, they may be able to move on. And there may be a large number of people who, um, who are less affected. And so it carries, you know, it buoys them forward. But I would say for many organization, it, it continues to haunt them. Um, and in fact, I'll work with organizations today and um, they'll share a trauma that happened maybe 10 years and see the threads and the effect. Um, and so begin to heal those. Diana, back to you, you uh, talked about uh, how at, in the aftermath, you just worked, uh, you tried to shield your, your pain or your experience from your, your uh, uh, young children. Uh, you, uh, and you just kind of did what, as I think you said in one of the books, uh, just get on with it, just get over it uh, kind of thing. Talk a little bit about that journey. And then what caused you to realize finally, this was not going to just be hidden and go away, but that it had to be named and something had to be done about it. Yeah. So for the six years after the shooting, um, I stayed and uh, in my wildest expectation, I never expected to ever leave. Um, in fact, leaving to me felt like death. Um, it was, I'd thrown myself into the work, into an environment that I already had such strong attachment to and had a strong sense of belonging and history and identity uh, associated with it. So um, in, in many ways, throwing myself into work and very meaningful work, um, was had an element of healing. You know, it, it kept me going for those six years. I also told myself that I'd been through lots of adversity and lots of challenges and lots of changes. Um, and we had an amazing team. So it, it seemed as though, of course, I can get over this. Uh, what I found um, was that every day, day in and day out, passing those scenes, uh, I would walk through the lobby and I'd get to the other side and I'd often say, oh good, I didn't think of the shooting once. And of course, then realizing, you know, of course I am thinking of it. Um, I just found I couldn't escape it. And yet I didn't want to escape the work environment. I didn't want to leave Long Beach and Miller Children's. Um, that sense of I would die if I left, but increasingly I knew some part of me was dying if I stayed. Um, I described my eventual leaving as an assisted fall to the floor. Um, that since I, I was falling, I didn't want anyone else to get hurt. Um, and I had a team of people um, outside the organization that I um, that had encircled me, um, caregivers, um, who helped me to the floor. And I decided that I needed to, um, the organization deserved a healthy CEO and I realized I had PTSD and it was not something that I could recover and heal from while staying. Um, so the organization deserved a healthy CEO and, and I deserved to recover. And so um, I stepped aside. It was amongst the hardest decisions uh, in my life, uh, of course, um, that sense of loss of work family and belonging and team, um, fulfillment, meaning, identity, all of that wrapped up into it. 
And of course I had meaning and purpose in other parts of my life, my family and friends. And thankfully, um, because that really buoyed me for the next couple of years. Um, and then I did recover. I went through an intensive uh, process of recovering. It wasn't easy, um, but I did fully recover and heal and really happy to now be able to share this story and help other people uh, who have undergone trauma. That's, that's very, very kind and generous of you, Diana. Just naming it PTSD, we usually think about that associated with Iraqi war veterans or others who've been in uh, those kind of combat situations, but uh, maybe it hasn't been uh, uh, a focus in healthcare where people are seeing some pretty gruesome, difficult, gut-wrenching uh, circumstances on a daily basis. Oh, without a doubt. And, you know, when I published the memoir, you know, certainly the, the story of the shooting um, conveyed a lot of what happens to individuals when they've been traumatized. And of course, then within weeks, of course, we were in the throes of the COVID pandemic and gosh, now really everyone in healthcare, all of us are under a tremendous amount of traumatic stress. Um, I don't know that everyone would develop PTSD, but I'm concerned about it. Um, and it was the motivation for writing that second book so that uh, we could raise awareness of traumatic stress, um, augment the great work their organizations are doing to support and care for uh, the healthcare workers and their teams, um, but also to destigmatize PTSD. We, we use the term flippantly you know, PTSD for this or PTSD about that. Um, but it is a very serious uh, condition. Um, many have said that it's really not a disorder. It's more an injury, uh, a brain injury, and the effects, not just emotional or mental, but also very much uh, reside in the body. Um, so that was a motivation around writing the book for healthcare workers and the traumatic stress they're, they're experiencing with the COVID pandemic. You mentioned some of the uh, symptoms of PTSD and maybe you could share some of those so people might start to think about how they can recognize PTSD in themselves or in others. Yeah. Well, anyone who's traumatized, of course, would have an initial biological reaction that's completely normal, the fight, flight, or perhaps freeze response. So something that's um, completely expected. But what we see with uh, people who eventually develop PTSD and PTSD usually is when symptoms such as anxiety and irritability and nightmares and that sense of reliving um, don't go away when they persist. Um, often, often people will have a high, um, heightened startle reflex. Um, they may be triggered by other events um, that are shocking or surprising. Uh, they can have a sense of being shattered, that, that what they thought was true about, let's say, safety and security is really unsettled, um, a sense of groundlessness. Um, so that sense of hypervigilance, being on the lookout, when those persist, um, often then people can um, enter into PTSD or into a diagnosis of PTSD. Um, but there's a range certainly of traumatic stress and, and not everyone develops PTSD, even if they are struggling in an acute period of time with traumatic stress. Um, but it is really important to raise the stigma. Um, I know for me, it, it was really true. It, it wasn't really possible to remain the CEO of a billion dollar healthcare company and be out as a person and a patient with PTSD. That was the frank reality. Um, well, congratulations to you for going through the process and, and recognizing uh, that you needed to make such a profound change. One of the sad things that you, stories you include in your book is your, your journey to try to find a place to help you cope with PTSD and uh, Sounds like you ended up in a in a uh, rehab uh, clinic that said it did PTSD, but not really. But you still managed to find a way forward. Maybe talk a little bit about that way forward and in, in that setting. And and 
I'd love to know whether there are more, whether this is becoming more broadly, um, uh, these kind of services more broadly available to help people who are struggling with PTSD. I really found that there are lots of wonderful people, individual therapists and clinical psychologists and psychiatrists who can help with patients who have PTSD uh, without a doubt. Um, and that field has grown and the, the training and awareness and expertise is really grown. And I had a wonderful team um, at home on an outpatient basis, but I got to a point where it was right after the San Bernardino shooting, which was really close to my home. Um, it involved an employee. There were many things that triggered. Um, there had been an episode of a potential active shooter at my daughter's school. There'd been a number of incidences um, that just made me realize I needed to separate myself from any kind of um, news or input. I needed respite. Um, I needed to be able to go away and rest and restore and get intensive um, care for PTSD. And so we did a lot of research trying to find a place. Um, what we found, and I think this is really pretty true today, there are not a lot of places where you can go specifically for PTSD treatment. Um, really almost all of them are associated with uh, substance abuse um, or, or another mental health issue. And it's probably due to reimbursement, probably due to um, PTSD continuing to evolve as a field uh, for treatment, probably a number of, of reasons. Um, well, and that uh, people with PTSD, often they will cope with substances. It, 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 uh, so those can be correlated with, without a doubt. Um, I found myself in a place that really was all about substance abuse. And of course, at first, I, I will say the stigma of that, I got to experience my own judgment, um, believe me. Um, when I, one, found myself there and felt my own judgment uh, about what it meant, um, it, it was a learning experience. Um, I had gone excitedly to this place thinking that it was gonna be um, a place of salvation. Um, of course, I instantly sort of revolted, but then decided that I was in a safe, I was in a safe spot and perhaps I had a lot to learn. And um, so that journey of staying uh, for a few weeks, um, it didn't turn out to be a lot of PTSD care. Um, and, but the, the, the people I met and the stories that I heard, um, they were instrumental in my own healing and recovery. So I included the story. I will say that um, I, I wavered on whether to include that story because I felt vulnerable. Um, it was exposing a part of my life that um, I really never wanted to talk about and I rarely shared with anyone. Um, I mean, really probably only the handful of the closest friends ever even knew I'd gone there. Um, but in the end, I decided that the value of the book in sharing and being vulnerable and coming out that way was much more important. And um, so I, I have heard from lots of people that it, it was a meaningful section. And so I'm really glad that I included it. Um, but I did have trepidation uh, for all the reasons that all of us could understand. Well, thank you for including that section. I too found it uh, uh, very, very informative. Um, I'm going to ask a few more questions, but if people have questions that they would like to ask of Diana, please submit them in the Q&A and uh, Katie will uh, uh, pull them uh, together. Uh, so uh, you uh, made a big transition uh, to from a pharmacist to a healthcare administrator and with a very big job and then working through your PTSD and you've become an author, uh, that's, that seems like a, it's got its own challenges to it. And uh, so tell us a little bit about that experience for you making that transition to being an author and uh, what are the best parts about it and what are the most difficult parts about it? Sure. Well, in um, 2015, uh, early 2015, when I retired from hospital administration, I really thought my career 
was over. Um, I didn't think my life was over, but I knew my career was over, the career that I'd known and my calling. Um, but after recovering and doing the hard work of recovering and healing, um, I began to think about it being really important to reemerge. And I had 30 years of experience um, and I knew that I wanted to continue to contribute. And so I joined a consulting firm, it's called Partnership Advantage and launched an executive coaching and leadership consulting practice um, and began to work with leaders at all levels of healthcare um, at every stage of their career. And I found it extraordinarily fulfilling. But uh, in the spring of 2017, um, Dean Joe Guglielmo reached out to me and asked if I would be the commencement speaker for the class of 2017 School of Pharmacy. And so um, I said, yes, I, I was ready to reemerge and in writing that short speech about leadership, um, it became clear that I wanted to write a book about leadership. And in writing that book about leadership, it became clear that I could not avoid writing about the most significant experience and event of my life. And so I decided that it needed to be a memoir. Um, and I wanted it to be a memoir because I wanted it to be um, a story from my own point of view. Um, I wanted it to pay tribute to the colleagues who we'd lost, uh, to Hugo Bustamante and Kelly Hales, who we'd lost. Um, I wanted it to pay tribute to the coworkers that I'd gone through that day with, and that I knew even with silence over the next six years, even if we didn't talk about it, that, that we had a bond. Um, I wanted to raise awareness about PTSD and about the impact of trauma on individuals and on organizations. And I wanted to introduce the word responsible. Um, it's such a complex word, has so many different meanings and what we think of it as leaders. Um, and so I, I uh, endeavored to write the book and gosh, there were so many days that I thought, Oh, I, I just can't do this. Um, but I just kept going. I, I, it was Kelly was in my mind. I was closest to Kelly. Just, I just, I felt like the story needed to be told. Um, so it was a labor of love. It took three years to write. Um, and again, it's written from my point of view, but there are thousands of other stories. There are thousands of other unique stories. And I wanted to honor that. Uh, I wanted to, in some way, be a voice for all the rest of us, all the rest of the people who'd experienced that day or, or who knew Kelly and Hugo and experienced it. Um, so I published it in March and then I, and I had said, I'm never writing another book. Um, it was really a grueling process, but I was approached by Dr. Mark Golston just a month later and Harper Collins wanted us to write a book about the COVID pandemic and the effect on of traumatic stress on healthcare workers. Um, so we wrote that and then they said, can you write one that is about leadership and leading through trauma? And so that comes out actually March 23rd. So um, to your point, three books in a year, um, it's, it's been a really interesting journey and a way to share and impart information and get to meet a lot of really interesting people, um, but also to have a lot of closure um, since publishing the book, so many of my former colleagues have reached out. So many people have said, this in some ways tells our story. Um, this helped me. Um, and so there's a sense of closure um, that I've been really happy to, to be able to provide. Diana, you, when you were describing uh, healthcare as a career, you talked about it as being a higher calling and serving others and that just sounds like you're doing exactly the same thing, uh, a different vehicle uh, this time. Uh, so uh, congratulations to you. Uh, I see we have a few questions here and I'll just uh, uh, pull them up. Well, here's a question. Did you get an MBA in your role as a CEO? Uh, did you get an no, MBA? No, I didn't. Uh, you didn't. I didn't do an MBA. I did do uh, that second year hospital pharmacy management uh, residency, which was an intensive one year. It was a great experience. Um, and then did a number of leadership academies um, through California Healthcare Foundation, 
um, through our own Memorial Care had an academy. So um, ongoing leadership and management training. Um, you have uh, the fan and Jacqueline Drexler says you're amazing, Diana. Uh, another uh, thank you so much for sharing your story. Uh, did you connect with the shooter's family after the event? You, you did mention that the, that difficult mm -hmm. set of decisions around attending the memorial service for the shooter mm -hmm. and well known to you and the organization. We were so fortunate in our organization to have a team of uh, social workers and chaplains um, that we in, encircled the families to the greatest degree we could and try to keep as many lines of communication and share as much information and, and be there for them as much as possible. Um, I think of them, all three families, I think of them every day um, and send well wishes. And uh, I struggled for a long time uh, while I was there wishing that I knew how to do more for them. Um, and I don't mean logistically, but how to connect even better um, with them. And, but I, I send well wishes and think of them every single day. Yeah. Uh, question that notes that you're a gifted writer. Where did you learn those skills? And I'll just have to say your, your level of emotional intelligence and your level of, uh, of, uh, of insight and ability to cut to the quick of the issue uh, is very impressive. Uh, where did those skills develop? Is it all a credit to Dean Guglielmo and what he taught at the School of Pharmacy? Yes. Yes. Well, it is. it was the educational background, absolutely. The rigor, the discipline, um, the need to be precise. So it, a large part of it is, accredited, it is uh, accredited to uh, education at UCI and UC San Francisco in particular. Um, and then having done a lot of reading, um, I think that uh, read, doing a lot of reading helped me to be a better writer. Um, and then I had a nice group of beta readers that helped to push me along and help to, to guide, you know, where I might slip up or where I might pick the wrong word. And so I was really blessed to have that. You know, there's uh, uh, from uh, Kelly, thank you for sharing your inspirational story and journey. Would you consider going back to the management, operational and minute side of the hospital work? Or do you like coach, coaching leaders more? Uh, and then she says, we're so proud of your accomplishments, but tell us what's gratifying about the coaching side. And would you ever, do you ever have a hankering to go back to running uh, a big operation again? You know, I don't know what the future will, um will uh, unveil. Um, I think about leading an organization often. Um, it was my wheelhouse. It was what I very much enjoyed doing, um, every day different, um, and nothing better than being, in my opinion, the CEO of a hospital. Um, it was just um, was what I was meant to do. That said, I have discovered this second calling. And so to be able to be of service to so many different leaders um, to be able to work with people at all levels of an organization and lots of different organizations has been really fulfilling. And so I find that my, uh, my true north, if you will, is to how might I contribute the most and in the best way. And so that's what guides my decision. So I can't say I would never return to direct administration. It's a matter of where um, can I serve best. And that would guide my decision. Yeah, that's that's great. Well, there's some other uh, suggestions that you participate in the next uh, NAMI virtual conference. Your story to inspire others. Uh, uh, Jacqueline Drexler would like you to give a few words to record to put on social media. Uh, uh, there's a question, and maybe we'll end with this one uh, because I do think it. Uh, it, it in a way summarizes the challenge of thinking about PTSD as a brain injury, but uh, think about how it how it uh, it changes you as a as a person, and and maybe uh, what lessons we in healthcare should take away uh, from from this story about PTSD and and its frequency and and the the road to recovery. Yeah, I do want to 
make sure I mention that um, Kelly Hales was a member of the class of 1979 and his classmates shortly after his death, they established a memorial scholarship uh, for him. And so every year, one or two third year students, UCSF pharmacy students are, are given a scholarship in his name. And um, so I really want to, to say that because it's an important part and why it was particularly meaningful for me to come back full circle, come back home to UCSF um, to raise that awareness of, of that scholarship that one of my worries um, after the shooting was our difficulty in talking about it. Um, I didn't want them to be forgotten. So I struggled with the difficulty of talking about it, but I did not want them to be forgotten. And so I'm so proud of his classmates for having established that scholarship. And um, I can certainly, after having published the book and from my own experience, know that they are not forgotten and their life and their legacy does live on with each of us. They have each, each of them touched many of us in so many different ways. And when we come back together and talk, we often share those stories about how they touched us. And so I know that their, their lives and their legacies are not forgotten and they've continued to have meaning. And their lives have had meaning through your words, Diana, and uh, your stories. Thank you so much uh, for sharing it tonight. Very, very moving. Let me Thank turn you. it back to Katie to close out the program tonight. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you, Diana, for coming um, together and having this conversation. Um, I think just the, the example you both uh, share of leadership and compassion and empathy, um, you know, is something um, that I think is so powerful. So thank you so much for coming here. And I know you're both very busy and, and sharing with our alumni community. And, you know, thank you to all the audience for joining us. Um, and we will share the recording so that you can watch this again and forward it and, and, and share it with others. Um, and, you know, we'll also send a survey that we hope you'll fill, it, fill out and let us know um, you know, additional programs we can do, additional alumni we can bring together um, with our UCSF leadership. So thank you again, Mark. Thank you, Diana, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you.